What up? I'm B, and welcome to my channel where we talk about all things true crime and current events. Today is another episode of Crafty Crimes where you and I sit down together, we talk about something related to the true crime world, and we do a little crocheting at the same time. So today we're going to be talking about a man named Robert Fisher. Uh, he's a 40-year-old man, he is from Brooklyn, New York, and he just is kind of your average guy. You know, he loves camping, being outdoors, he loves hunting, fishing, just all of that stuff. He's a really active dude, and uh, he's pretty in shape, you know. He, he loves to be active, he loves spending time outside, he is a pretty strong believer in God, he is a man of faith. And he, he's a dad too. So the type of dad that he is, is just kind of like an old fashioned dad. You know, his father-in-law says that he is just, he's the best dad. There's a lot of structure in their house, but there is also so much love. You know, he has these rules. His kids are expected to follow these rules, meet his expectations, but it's never done in like a harsh way or an intimidating really environment from what his father-in-law has said and his father-in-law also said that he loves Robert so much he honestly thinks of uh, Robert and his daughter Mary as one like they're a unit they're partners that's how he sees them and then obviously Robert has a wife named Mary she is 38 years old and uh, Mary is just she loves fun she <laughs> Uh, is such a sweet lady. She was actually friends with Robert's sister before they started dating, like before they even met. She was really close with Robert's sister. And uh, Robert's sister, when she was pregnant, this was when Mary and Robert were still dating, Mary would actually go with her to all of her appointments, like as many as she could. She was so excited for Robert's sister to have a baby. She was always there. She is super supportive overall just a really nice person that so many people have just amazing things to say about. Now, Robert's childhood wasn't the easiest. Uh, he grew up his whole life with his parents together, but when he was 15, they ended up getting a divorce and it was really hard on him. He ended up living with his dad and his dad's new wife and he just wasn't really crazy about his stepmom. You know, it just... It wasn't the best relationship, and it was kind of hard on him. I think in most cases, if you are a child and your parents are divorced, that's kind of going to lead you to, it's obviously going to be hard, but it's also going to give you the sense of like, I want better for my family. I, you know, I know how much this hurt me, and so I want, you know, I don't ever want to do this. I want to find the person that I'm most meant to be with and you know, live a happy life with them. And that's kind of how Robert felt. He, that was his approach later in life when he met Mary. Um, but so, you know, he had that, and that was a really tough experience for him. And eventually he uh, turned 18 and moved to California, San Diego specifically, and he joined the Navy. And after four years, he was honorably discharged, and he became a fireman. Unfortunately, he did get hurt, so uh, he hurt his back pretty bad, and he was going to need surgery for it. But this kind of shows you what type of guy Robert is. I would describe him as steadfast. Like, he is a planner. He is principled. He takes his time with things, you know? So him and Mary, they were dating at this time, and uh, he put off his surgery for a few years. A necessary medical <laughs> procedure. He put it off for a few years because he was very aware of the fact that if something went wrong, it was going to be rough. And so he didn't want to have to worry about things financially. He paid down a good portion of their debt. He paid off one of their cars. He had money in savings because he was like, you know, if, if for some reason this doesn't work out and I can't work, I want to make sure that we are good to go. So he did that. He had the surgery and Luckily, everything went well. It didn't, you know, it wasn't like a miracle fix. He still kind of had some pain. He had a pretty nasty scar on his back from it. And when he walked, you could kind of tell that 
he just seemed kind of uncomfortable. He seemed uneasy walking, but he had the surgery and nothing went wrong. It went as well as could be expected. He was good to go. In the early 90s, Mary and Robert moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. And this area, it's a super nice area. It is very family friendly. There are tons of families there, like tons of outdoor events. It's just, it's a really great area to live in. There are very low rates of crime. It's one of the safest cities in the country. Just, they picked a good spot. And after they moved there, Robert became a surgical technician as well as a respiratory technician. And by 2001, their family had grown. They had a son and a daughter. Uh, they had Brittany, who was 12, and Bobby, who was 10. So Brittany, both her and her brother, they look like their dad. They, you can see just the family resemblance is so strong. And Brittany, sweetest little girl, she had this light about her, and you could just see it. You know, she... Her parents were very big in the church. They were very involved, and she was all about that. She loved going to church. She loved Jesus. She would talk about it to anyone and everyone, just couldn't wait to share something that she had a really strong belief in with everybody. And she was also super smart. She was actually a member of the National Junior Honor Society at her school, which is a pretty big deal. You know, you have to have good grades. You have to be well-behaved, you know. It's a really cool thing to be a part of. And as far as Bobby, uh, Robert Jr., uh, he is just a fun, loving little boy. It kind of seems like he took after his mom in this. You know, she was super fun, loved to laugh, and Bobby was pretty much the same. One of his friend's mom, they said that one day after church, her son had invited Bobby over, and then later that day, they had to go back to the church for bell choir practice, and... She was like, oh, you guys are lucky. I've got the convertible here. So if you want to take it, you know, we can go ahead and do that. <laughs> and Bobby was like, yep, let's do it. I'm down. So they took the convertible there. They had the top down. And he was just, he had the best time. He was laughing and putting his arms up and feeling the wind. Just, he just loved life. And he also took after his dad because he was very into outdoor activities as well. He was actually in a hunter safety course and his dad would always quiz him on stuff like, you know, what do you do in this scenario? What's this called? You know, he just wanted to make sure that his son was doing a good job in the course and they really bonded over that. So from the outside, you have this really just amazing family, sweet family, tons of friends, really involved in the church, loved by everybody that they knew but there was a bit of a darker side. Robert and Mary fought a lot, and Mary would often call Robert's mom and just talk about how Robert was just so hard to please. He was really strict. He was really particular, and she was just having a tough time. She would always call his mom and kind of air these complaints and try and get advice. And unfortunately, Robert's mom would more often than not tell her, yep, that sounds just like his dad. That's exactly how his dad was when we were together. And paraphrasing what she said, Robert's mom basically said, tell him what's up. You have to be strict with him. You got to tell him, you know, how it's going to be. You have to stand up to him if you want things to get better and you want things to start going your way or else he's just going to keep being the way that he is. So this led to Mary and Robert having these huge blowout fights where she would just scream at him and the neighbors could all hear it. They never heard Robert yell back, but Mary would always just tell him like in these fights, she would be like, you're worthless, you're a loser, I could have done so much better than you, I should have married someone else, I should have gotten a divorce from you a long time ago, just reaming this dude. And like I said, the neighbors never heard him yell back at her, but we don't really know what he may have said at a, at a moderate decibel, you know, we don't know what he was saying during these fights. And it should be noted that Robert was not without his oddities as well as his flaws, some of the neighbors said that he was a different kind of guy. He was a very smart guy, but every time you spoke to him, it felt like he was taking in 
every single word that you were saying and analyzing it. He wasn't like a quick-witted, haha, have a good time kind of guy. He was very serious and you kind of felt like you were being judged every time you talked to him. Additionally, he was pretty gruff with Mary, you know, a little bit beyond being particular about things. There's like family movies where she's trying to show stuff with the kids and be like, oh yeah, it's this holiday, having a good time, show your outfits, like all this stuff. And he'll look at her and be like, okay, turn off the camera. And so he's not yelling at her, but he's just being kind of harsh, like kind of cold. And Mary's not scared of him though. She's like, yeah, 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 in a minute, I'm filming this, like I'll turn it off. And so it doesn't seem like there's any type of abuse going on there because she is not, like I said, she's not afraid of him, but it just seems kind of weird. He seems like he has a lot of resentment when she's making these videos and you can kind of see it in his eyes that he is just, he's very serious. Turn the camera off. So that's kind of an odd thing. And additionally, some of his friends, they would all go hunting together. There's a forest area about two hours away from Scottsdale that Robert would go to all the time. And one time they were up there, they had killed a moose and they're gutting it. Next thing they know, Robert is getting blood from this moose and rubbing it all over his face and just celebrating the kill. And they'd also said that he was kind of using unsafe practices when they were up there and so none of them really felt comfortable going hunting with him anymore. And one of the biggest kind of incidents that was an issue in Mary and Robert's marriage is that Robert at one point had an affair. So remember how I told you he had like a bad bag and he had to get surgery and all that? You know, like I said, the surgery went well, but he was still having issues, which is common for a lot of people. And so he would go get these massages. And so at one of these massage appointments, something happened uh, of the sexual variety. And I don't know, there's not any details if like this was a prostitute or just the regular massage that went a little bit far. But anyway, he had he had sexual relations with the masseuse and ended up with a UTI. He had to go get treatment for it. And then he um, ended up going to his pastor and telling the pastor what had happened. He felt so bad. He took marriage so incredibly seriously and his marriage was super important to him. So obviously he's struggling with this and he doesn't know what to do. And his pastor tells him, you have to tell Mary, you have to get this off your chest. You guys have to work through it if, if that's what she wants. But either way, nothing's going to get better until you come clean. So Robert goes to Mary and tells her what it happened. And she's upset like any normal person would be. And they end up being separated for a little bit. But eventually they decide that they value their marriage. They value their kids. They want to stay together. So they get counseling and they get back together. So on April 9th, 2001... Mary had taken her son Bobby to the church. He had a class that night. So she went with him and then Robert took Brittany to her school because she had a ceremony that night. So they each, you know, took one kid and went their separate ways and then eventually came home. And about 10 p.m. that night, neighbors reported hearing another one of their screaming matches. Well, I guess it's not a match, but Another one of their fights where Mary is just going off on Robert and that went on for a while, but eventually Robert leaves the house and he takes Mary's car, he takes their dog and goes to an ATM about half a mile away from their house, so pretty close. He pulls out $280, which is the maximum limit for that day, and then drives off. The next morning, there's an explosion, followed by a massive fire that engulfs Robert's home immediately. So neighbors start calling the police. They're calling the fire department. They are just, they're letting them know, hey, something is going on. There's a house on fire. We need you to come out here. We need your help. So they sent police out there. They sent firefighters out there. And as soon as the firefighters got there, they were extremely concerned because they said burning flesh has a very distinct smell 
and we can tell that there are people inside of that house. Eventually, they did get the fire out, and when they were able to go in and investigate, see what was going on, who's inside, they found Mary, Brittany, and Bobby inside, and obviously they were dead. They were in their beds, though, and it looked like they were pretty comfortable according to detectives. It didn't seem like they had smelled anything or heard anything or, you know, nothing woke them up to get them out of bed and get them out of the house. And they were really just questioning why that was. What happened? They're looking at all the evidence, figuring out how the fire started, what happened. And eventually they find that both Bobby and Brittany, they had had their throat slashed from ear to ear and the cuts were so deep that they were almost decapitated and mary she had the same thing her her throat was slashed it was very deep cut and she also had been shot in the head so obviously somebody killed them and then they set the house on fire and how they did that was they had poured accelerant all down the hallway and they had also uncoupled a, a natural gas line from the furnace, which would lead natural gas to leak out into the air. And then they had set a candle in the hallway and lit it, left it there. And that eventually caused the explosion and caught the entire house on fire. So in the course of their investigating, they obviously find that and then they're talking to neighbors, trying to figure out anything they can about this family, what's going on, you know, is that all of them? And they realize that there's a husband, Robert, who's missing. So they want to find Robert as quickly as they can. They're not sure where he is. Neighbors talk about how, you know, he loves going up north, he loves camping, it's possible he's on one of these trips. Um, you know, we, we don't know. And so they're putting it out on the news saying, hey, if, if you're Robert, come home. They, they need you down here. Something's happened. They're thinking this guy could be in the woods. He could have no idea what's going on, and he could come back home to this horrific tragedy. But then, as they are removing what they can from the home, they realize that Mary, you know, she'd been shot in the head, and the type of gun that shot her was a 357 Magnum. And unfortunately, that was one of the same guns that Robert had, and it was missing from the house. So the investigation switches from, we gotta find this guy, make sure he's okay, tell him what happened to his family, what somebody else did, to we gotta find him because he's a pretty strong suspect. And they didn't want to put this out on the news. They still wanted to frame it as, you know, come home. We want to make sure you're okay. We want to make sure you're safe. Because they knew that if they said what they were really looking at him for, he wouldn't come home. But unfortunately, they don't know who. Somebody leaked the information that they were looking at Robert for a triple homicide. And the news put it everywhere. It was on blast, it was being talked about constantly, and investigators really kind of felt like at that point, we're not going to find him. Our hope of getting him, it's just gone. So a few days go by, Robert obviously still hasn't come back, and a few people had reported seeing him up in Payson uh, by the Muggy on Rim. And so where that is, if you're in Scottsdale right here, and you go kind of like that, and go up, there's a little tiny town called Payson, and then just outside of it is this massive forest, and that's the same forest that Robert would love to go camping in, and he would love to spend his weekends at. So a few people have reported seeing Mary's Toyota 4Runner up there, a guy who looked like Robert driving up along the rim, and um, police believe that to be credible. Additionally, a bartender said that someone came into her bar. It was a man and a woman. The woman went to the bathroom, the man came up, got a drink, and then went across the floor to the fireplace and was just kind of standing there, head down, not really trying to make eye contact. The woman came out and it seemed like they were kind of arguing and 
she really thought that that was Robert, so she reported it to the police. And then the next day, some residents of a town called Rye, and Rye is just south. It is like 20 minutes outside of Payson. They said that a woman had come to their door. She said that her and her boyfriend, they got into this fight. They broke up. She needed to call a cab, and she was wondering if she could use their phone. So they let her in. She calls a cab, and they're kind of talking to her. What's going on? Are you okay? Like, you know, what's up? And turns out that the description of the man she said she was dating was very, very close to the same description that the bartender had given police. So they call and they report it. So we have those three reports and the police are like, okay, you know, this is an area he knows. These seem to be credible reports. We're pretty sure that he is in the Payson area or in the forest just outside of it. And then 10 days after the explosion, so on April 20th of 2001, a camper called the authorities to report that he thought he had seen the car that they were looking for out in the forest. They go out there, the, the authorities go out there and confirm, yes, this is Mary's car, um, but Robert's not in it. So they bring Scottsdale SWAT up there, they bring the FBI, anybody they can to come up, and they start combing this area for as much as they can. And they spend the next three days going around they've got cadaver dogs they are just looking everywhere and there are three caves near the area where the car was found so they get like cameras on they're attached to like not hoses but they it's like a flexible thing so they reel them down into these caves see if there's anything down there can't really find anything so they send spelunkers down to see if maybe he was there and he's no longer there nothing and unfortunately, the weather was not the best. It was raining, it was snowing, they didn't have a ton of visibility, and the SWAT team that they brought up to look, they are skilled, they are talented, they're well-trained, but they are well-trained for an urban area, and they are not trained to find somebody in the forest. So it's not really a fruitful investigation and then eventually the weather gets so bad that they have to call it off. So really the only things they found from finding Mary's car were a pile of human feces right outside of the front door. They find Robert's dog, which for some reason he's left behind even though he decided to bring the dog with him, and they find a cup inside. And the only prints that they can find on the whole car is a single fingerprint on the cup inside of the car. You know, they already suspected that he was the one who set the fire and killed his family, but finding the car, finding his prints on it, finding his dog there, they're like, okay, yep, this is our dude. We got to find him. But unfortunately, Robert is still in the wind. They have not found him, but this was a huge case for the state of Arizona and even nationally and so the police get like four to five calls per day with people thinking that they've seen him reporting leads um, he has connections in Florida and New Mexico so people in those areas will call and the police they appreciate it because they want to find this guy they want to bring him to justice but not much has come from that in 2004 uh, someone who matched Robert's description was reported to be in Canada and so what they actually did was they brought one of Robert's old neighbors up to Canada and because they knew that he would be able to recognize him and identify him you know the police only know what they've seen from like pictures and videos so they they wanted somebody who actually knew him to be able to identify that this was him so they bring him up there they book him into jail and then they bring the person who is supposedly Robert in. He's kind of scanning the room, seeing what's going on, passes over the neighbor, and then stops and looks back at him and makes direct eye contact. And the neighbor said, that is him. That is Robert. I would know him anywhere. I lived next to him for 10 years. That is him. He matched the description. Robert had a gold tooth on his upper left side of his mouth and 
they were like, you know, he could have it still, it could be missing, whatever, dude was missing the exact same tooth. This is Robert. But then they take his fingerprints and it is not him. And people have gone back and forth on how um, believable and how credible, like how legitimate it looks when you alter your fingerprints, if that can link you to somebody else. And so there's conflicting theories on it, but police say that's not him. This guy's mom came in and, and we don't believe it's him. We think the neighbor wants it to be him because he wants him to get caught, but it's just not and we have to let him go. So that was in 2004 and then five years later, some tourists were in Guatemala and they were just having a good time taking some pictures, you know, documenting their vacation, as you do. And apparently they had gotten this guy in the background of a few of their photos. And when he noticed that they were taking pictures in his general direction, he went up to them and confronted them about it. And they got into kind of this argument because, why are you taking pictures of me? Don't take pictures of me. I've killed before and I'll kill again. So they get startled and they call the police and report it. You know, they call the American police because uh, they think that it's him. And we haven't heard what came from that. The only thing the FBI has said about looking into that lead is that they will not release any further information on active leads. So could be a trail they're following, but that was in 2009. It's been 10 years. So that was the last really kind of accepted credible report of Robert. Now officials and the reporters who covered this whole story, they're pretty divided on what they think has happened. There is a pretty strong camp of them that believe that Robert snapped, he went into a rage, he did this to his family, and he fled up to the mountains because he was scared, he wasn't thinking straight, and when he realized what he had done, they think he killed himself. He shot himself in the head and someday we're going to find a skull and a rusty gun and that's going to put it to bed. And they really think this because Robert only took out $280. They, he had more wealth that he could have eventually gotten to. Like he had mutual funds, he had savings accounts, all this stuff, and he didn't take any of it. So what's he going to do? You know, how's he going to be living a whole life without money? But the other camp says, no, he knew what he was doing. He planned it out. He did this on purpose. And they think that the woman who he was reported to be seen with was another um, affair that he was having. And he convinced this woman to help him escape. And then once she did, you know, he was done with her and he broke up with her and he left. And the people who are in this camp think that either he is living in the wilderness or he's fled the country and is living somewhere else. And the reason that they think that he left with the intention to live and create a new life, either in the forest or somewhere else, is because he took his stuff with him. He took all of his clothes, he took a large portion of his belongings, he took a few guns with him. They think that he planned this, he had it in mind, he didn't know when he was gonna do it, but he had some sort of backup plan for if things went wrong and he had to get rid of his family and get away. There's no real facts either way about it. Like there's no factually backed scenario that is better than the other. I think he planned for it. He is a Navy man. He works in the medical field. Like he's a smart guy. He's a disciplined guy. He's determined. He's a planner. He paid down all that debt before his back surgery. I don't think that he would do something on a snap decision like that. So I think that he probably had been kind of saving this, maybe stockpiling some money away before he committed this and fled. And I think he's probably living in another country. People like to talk about, oh, he had so many guns. He, you know, he's probably living off the land. He's living in the wilderness, all this stuff. Like people really like to focus on how many guns he had and all that, but he lived in Arizona where gun laws are extremely lenient and a large majority of the population owns a firearm. It's not abnormal for a person to own multiple firearms, especially if they like camping and they like fishing and hunting and all that stuff. So 
while I do think he could have survived for a few days out in the forest, I don't think for the past almost 20 years. It just doesn't seem reasonable. But that's just my theory on it. I would love to hear what you think, what your theory is, where you think he may be, um, if you think he's even still alive, and what you think of this whole case. It is just so sad and so baffling, and um, Robert is currently on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list, so they are actively looking for him, actively trying to find him, bring him home, and bring him to justice, finally. So I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, FBI Phoenix office's phone number in a highlighted comment, as well as the Scottsdale Police Department. If you're in Arizona and you know anything about this, or even if you're in, if you're anywhere, if you're in Florida, New Mexico, where he has those connections, if you're in a different country, if you have a credible lead on this guy, Give him a call because, like they said, even if nothing pans out from the lead, they would rather have it and they would rather look into it and follow the possibility of actually finding him rather than you think, oh, it doesn't matter, like it could be wrong, I'm not going to report it. So I will put those in a highlighted comment. Like I said, let me know what your theory is and where you think he is today. And while you're doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, that would be awesome if you're subscribed already. Thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you and I love being able to just sit here, hang out, and talk about whatever. With all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Thank you so much for watching and remember to go out there. Be the voice of reason in a world full of crazy. Bye.